a few more people are, are still popping in, um, but we may as well start with our introductions. Um, so first of all, we've got my colleague Paul here with me. Um, he is from IEC Abroad. He is a Hi. senior education consultant. Um, so yeah, thank you so much for joining us, Paul. Um, thank you. Thank you. Um, he'll be helping, as I say, with the, the Q&A and helping to answer any questions that you have potentially, um, you know, regarding coming over to study in the UK. Um, and then we also have Daniel Prince from Lancaster University. Um, he is the course director for the MSc in Cybersecurity. Um, so thank you so much for taking the time out to um, present this seminar for us today, Daniel. No worries. Uh, thanks for having me and thanks to everybody uh, for, for joining today. Um, as the title suggests, I'm here to have a, a bit of a chat around what cybersecurity is anyway, and certainly how we uh, view cybersecurity at Lancaster University uh, and go into maybe some facts and figures around the industry and, and potential jobs in, in and around UK and, and, and Europe and just give you an idea of uh, what you can expect from, from a cybersecurity career. So um, my name's Daniel Prince. Uh, I am the course director for the MSc in Cybersecurity here at Lancaster. I actually set this up uh, program up about 10 years ago. So next year will be the 10th anniversary of the program. But um, I have a number of other uh, hats that I wear. And the other hat is I'm a deputy director for our Cybersecurity Research Center. So Lancaster University is one of uh, 18 in, uh, higher education institutions in the UK who have been accredited by our uh, uh, national uh, intelligence agency, the NCSC and uh, EPSRC, who are a, uh, a research awarding body uh, as an academic center of excellence in cybersecurity research. That means that we've demonstrated to UK government that uh, the work that we do broadly in cybersecurity is, is of an exceptional standard and that we are continually invest in that. Um, the other thing you should know about our program, the MSc in uh, Cybersecurity, is that it's uh, certified by the NCSC as well. So uh, what that basically means is they've reviewed our curriculum and uh, they believe that it, 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 it represents um, the, the sort of core knowledge that uh, individuals will need to go into uh, the cybersecurity uh, um, domain. So I've been working in cybersecurity for nearly 20, 20 years now. Uh, as I said, I set up the uh, MSc in cybersecurity. Before that, I was teaching individual and discrete courses. Um, I do uh, cybersecurity research, and my primary research focus is on network security and also on uh, cybersecurity risk management. Um, so, you know, Lancaster University is one of the recognized centers of excellence for cybersecurity research in the UK, and we do a lot of security research work more broadly. And we take a, a truly multidisciplinary approach to uh, our research work. And that stems into, um, so into the cybersecurity program. So uh, unlike what you may be used to in terms of conversations around cybersecurity, this will be very broad because we believe that cybersecurity is a broad problem. But where does that problem come from? Technology is changing our way of life. Life, it's, it's impacting everything that we do. Cars are now platforms like Tesla's. They're, they're basically uh, computer systems on wheels. They get software downloads and that makes them go faster. Everything that we do is now touched by technology. We have smartphones, we have smart fridges, we have smart doors. So every aspect of cybersecurity, as every aspect of uh, technology um, is becoming digital in some fashion. In my, my own personal home, most of the light bulbs are smart in some way. That means I can turn them on and off from my, um, uh, fr from my mobile phone. Um, we have you know, surveillance cameras in, in the house and so on. And, and all of these things would basically weren't possible 10, five, even two, three years ago. So the, the march of change and the uh, integration of technology is, is really uh, significantly increasing. And what we like to do is talk about the change from digitization to digitalization. And what we saw was industries going through 
this idea that they were digitizing information, moving away from paper-based systems. But now we're moving to a digitalization phase where we're trying to put digital technologies into every aspect of, of business. And that will include things like uh, industrial IoT, so smart manufacturing. We're talking about clever additive manufacturing. And at Lancaster, we're working on things where you can do your 3D design, upload it in a protected way into the cloud, and then it will get did, uh, manufactured for you and then shipped to your door. So, you know, you, uh, you don't have to have the own, your own technology at home to do that. You know, this, this is a service that can be provided. And these things are in, interacting across the board with businesses as simple as um, daycare centers, all the way up to manufacturing and large companies. So I've put, pulled some statistics here, and this, these come from the uh, 2020 Talas Data Threat Report, um, uh, and they're primarily European and UK based. But if you look more broadly across all of the the reports that are coming out, you'll probably see very similar kind of uh, themes coming out. So you know, just looking at um, the fact that digital capabilities are being embedded into into the enterprise and tightly linked with um, the way that uh, that businesses are working. So this enables managers to be able to get uh, real-time dashboard information about what's happening on say a production line um, we can see a significant increase in the adoption of that technology but we can also see things that uh, businesses believe that digital technology will aggressively disrupt their business going forward and that's great that means that people can innovate that means they can drive forward um, ideas and if we look uh, just in, in the UK uh, and, and around Europe, we can see that UK, the UK is actually one of the um, sort of one of the key drivers here. We're, we're really keen to uh, try and get integrate the digital capabilities and also disrupt um, current markets by coming up with new ideas. So th this is all really um, great. And one of the examples that we can see from this is really the adoption of cloud technology. Um, so a cloud has been around for quite a long time, but it's not until sort of this year we've started to see this tipping point that globally we're you probably using the cloud more than we have be, ever been before. Certainly when uh, just looking at the, our own transition at the university over the last couple of years, we've, we've moved on to cloud platforms for a lot of our data storage just because it makes life easier for us to be able to move between different machines, uh, to be able to work from home, which is particularly important at, um, that given the current situation. And so cloud technology is now mature enough to be a core um, platform for, for a lot of businesses. Um, and, but again, that, that presents uh, some issues that we need to deal with. But there are also other technologies that everybody uh, is uh, keen to use or is planning to use. And things like software as a service application, social media, we're all familiar with. Um, all the way, moving all the way through to um, uh, processing technologies like containers and dockers and then big data environments are massively growing. So we're moving a lot of our business processes uh, online and we're even moving a lot of our own personal processes and, and the way that we interact online. And this has been a trend that's been growing for quite a considerable number of years now and it doesn't give us... Uh, it doesn't seem to have any signs of, of slowing down. And certainly we've seen with um, the, the, the sort of the global pandemic, a massive shift to, to remote working, which has increased the adoption of a lot of, a lot of technologies. The challenge with this is that it's creating a rich target. So, you know, we've seen here that uh, the assessment of the companies that, that Tal has looked at, you know, about 50% of them have, have had some sort of breach um, and then around about a quarter to a third of them have had a breach within the last year. In actual fact, um, you know, looking at some research from Forbes, 71% of UK-based business decision makers believe the shift to 100% remote working during COVID crisis has increased the likelihood of a cyber breach. Um, so that's, that's a significant uh, issue. And we've seen over a 400% increase in cyber attacks during the pandemic. However, 70% of all the breaches still originate at the endpoints, so at the end systems of people using the technology, your laptop, your tablet, your, your, your mobile phone. 
And as we start to work from home, this, um, uh, this blurring of the lines between home technology and work technology is causing um, more issues. Members of your family perhaps using a work tablet to, to play a game could potentially cause a bit of a problem if they download that game and it might be infected. But it's not just normal businesses. Um, if we think about something like airports, airport uh, cybersecurity uh, at airports is really important because it's about moving people around. Um, so 97% uh, of the, the world's top 100 uh, uh, airports failed a cybersecurity test recently. So there's a lot of things going on that we need to think about. And there, there are a lot of threat actors that are coming after us from cyber criminals, potentially other competitors, cyber terrorists that, that are, uh, are interesting in making a, a particular point, hacktivists, and even nation states we need to, to start to think about. But, in court, but it's not just the external threat. There's a lot of issues around uh, insider threat as well. People internally in the uh, organization potentially doing um, bad things to our systems that we need to tackle with and we need to understand why, what motivates them and why they're doing, why they're undertaking these types of attacks. So why is more, not more being done? Well, it's a complex problem. You know, the cybersecurity is, is not just a technology issue, which we'll talk about. The complexity of the way that technology and security and business and people all interact create these cybersecurity challenges. Often cybersecurity is under, underfunded, so we might not have the enough money that we think we, can, we need to use to be able to protect the systems. There's concerns about the impact on business processes. What happens if we put the security measure in place? Does it slow things down? Does it mean we have a loss of performance? Um, one of the big ones globally, and I'll talk about this towards the end, is there's a lack of staff. There's a lack of skills here to be able to manage and undertake and develop all of this stuff. So there's a series of, uh, of issues. And one of the big things that keeps coming up is a lack of perceived need. A lot of business owners don't believe that cybersecurity is an issue for them. So there's something there that's going on that we will seek to, to want to deal with. So what is cybersecurity? You may have heard a lot of ideas around what cybersecurity is, but what I'm going to do is just go through the perception of cybersecurity from, from my point of view and, and also the, uh, the, the, the university's point of view. From where I'm sitting, it is, a, it is a multidisciplinary task. We need to find a way to solve some of our big protection challenges for the, for the business. So is it all just about the technology? Well, technology plays a big part. It's increasing our utility within our businesses, but we need to find out ways to protect it. So in part, we have to think about how we protect the technology that we have. And in consequence from that, we have to think about how we protect the information that that technology holds. We have to balance both. The information is important, but actually our technology is important as well because we're seeing an increase in the adoption of or the attacks against our technology such that it can be then used in other attacks. If I have a nice big uh, internet connection that has lots of bandwidth, that can be used to, to target and attack other individuals for, in things like denial of service attacks. So in part, we have to protect the technology and in that, that will also protect um, the information. However, the technology is there to help support business processes. So we need to think about how we use that, uh, how we protect the business process in and of itself. The technology doesn't sit there by itself. It's there for a reason within that business. It's there to support the business. And as we've seen from the earlier slide, it's tightly coupled with the way that we manage the, um, our business processes. So we need to think about the business process and how that technology fits to ensure that we can protect the, the, the overall function of the business. But business processes and technologies don't just sit there by themselves. They need people to work, work them. They need people to make them do the things that the business finds productive. So we need to find ways to protect the people. And people are often one of the easiest ways in through things like social engineering, spam, and so on. So being able to help educate them, protect them, not just in their workplace, but in their home lives is really important as part of uh, a cybersecurity practice. Communication is a fundamental element of cybersecurity. Being able to explain to somebody what a cybersecurity risk is, what the potential threats are, why we need to spend a certain amount of money, being able to articulate the business need is vitally important. 
what we need to do as cybersecurity specialists is to bridge the gap between several, several parts of the business, between the management, between the finance, between the technologists, and between the business unit owners to be able to explain what's going on. And this is the approach that we take at Lancaster. We take a multidisciplinary approach. We have, within our program, we have eight taught courses, and then we do, um, it, then the students will do the dissertation, which is what they're working on at the moment, which is a large research project. But within the taught modules, what we do is we cover um, a range of subjects. So we cover systems design, we cover forensics, we cover um, uh, offensive security techniques, and those are our core technology modules. But then we cover things like management, information security, risk management, which is a specific discipline in and of itself, cybercrime from sociology, international relations from um, our politics and uh, philosophy department, and then also introduction to law. All of these disciplines are really important to, for people to be able to understand the cybersecurity issues and then be able to communicate them and bridge the gap between the organizations and really the, the, the elements of the organization. And really it's those people that can do that, which are who are the most successful. And that's the protection part, but cybersecurity is so much more. Cybersecurity is one of the most innovative uh, disciplines out there. We're constantly having to update our knowledge, our skills, our techniques, as the, the attackers constantly update and defend uh, and create new te techniques to attack us. So we're constantly innovating in terms of uh, defense. So as part of a business, it's a really focused, innovative activity. And that has impact on a wider uh, elements of the business. So what we talk about at Lancaster University is the cyber innovation agenda. Within the UK, there are two concepts um, that are related to cybercrime, which I've stolen and uh, used as part of this, developing the cyber innovation agenda. And that's cyber enabled crime and cyber dependent crime. So I talk about cyber enabled innovation and cyber dependent innovation. Cyber enabled innovation is thinking about the business and how can we use cybersecurity, the stuff that we've spoken about um, before, to create more productivity or do things better in, within the business. It's about thinking differently around cybersecurity. Um, how can we take the protection that we put in place to enable the business to do more? And I use the analogy of brakes. So when you talk about car brakes, yes, they're, they're a protective measure and they, they allow you to stop. But if you think about something like a Formula One car or a high performance car, the better brakes you have, the faster you can go because it means you can stop quicker. And so what we're thinking about here is how can we take cybersecurity technology, cybersecurity approaches and enable the business to do more. An example of this is around um, data. The recent introduction of the general data protection, protection regulation in the UK restricts, uh, or it, it is about pr protecting the individual end consumer. And one of the things that came out of that is the reduction of the data that you hold for individuals. The problem is if you reduce down the data that you hold for individuals, you, usually, you lose the utility uh, that you have from collecting a large amount of data. So you won't be able to run big data analytics or machine learning to be able to say if you're a, um, an online retailer, be able to work out and suggest products that somebody might buy based on previous purchases. If you have cybersecurity in place, it would enable you to hold more or uh, increase the quality of the data that you're holding with reduced risk or at least at the same level of risk as holding less data. That means the utility of your organization and the data you hold goes up, which means you can do more, you can sell more, and you become, can become more productive. Cyber dependent innovation is really thinking about the foundations of cybersecurity technology. So this is about taking the things that, we've, the, that we use to, to protect ourselves and see if we can use them more innovatively. And typically you see within cybersecurity, um, three things commonly spoken about, confidentiality, integrity, and, and availability. So confidentiality is making sure that the information can't be read by somebody else. And usually that's a cryptographic uh, approach. Integrity is making sure the data doesn't become corrupted. And availability is talking about the data being there when you need it. To help with that, we extend that out and think about authentication, authorization, and non-repudiation. So authentication is proving who you are. Think about new biometric approaches, fingerprints, face scans. There's so, there's so much going on in that space. Authorization is then 
working out what I can do. Just because I've proved who I am doesn't necessarily mean that I'm actually authorized to then go into a bank and pull out a, a million pounds, right? I need to have something that controls that. Non-repudiation is around proving that somebody has actually taken that, to undertaken a task or a, a role or done something on a system um, and that individual not being able to deny that at a later date. So again, if we think about something like find my phone and or an application for location-based services based off a, a smartphone, the focus of that application is really about finding something. But the only way that it works is by underpinning that with cybersecurity technologies. We need, uh, we need uh, cryptography and confidentiality to ensure that the data is protected. We need to make sure that we authorize it to only certain people can see it. We need to make sure that it is, um, yeah, the integrity of that data is kept uh, accurate because we don't want to say it's a mission critical. I want to find somebody who may be stuck um, or, 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 or at risk. We don't want that information to be incorrect. So we've got an application here, which is finding something, but the only way that it works is through using cybersecurity technologies in an innovative way. And that's what we talk about in terms of cyber dependent innovation. So cybersecurity is really broad. It's from everything from protection all the way through to innovating in business. And it's a good business to be in. Um, I'm going to give you some stats around uh, uh, where we are with uh, cybersecurity, but it's over the last 20 years, I've seen it massively grow and massively be invested in. So uh, this is some figures from, um, uh, again, from Forbes. Enterprises are predicted to spend uh, 12.6 billion on cloud security tools uh, by 2023 um, globally. Um, enterprise uh, spending on cloud security solutions is predicted to increase from uh, 600 million um, to 1.6 uh, billion, um, which is a massive annual growth. Um, spending on infrastructure protection is uh, predicted to grow um, by 7.68% uh, um, between 2020 and 2023. Um, and endpoint security tools are 24% of IT spending. Um, and, and so we can see that that's a significant increase in terms of where people are spending their money. Unfortunately, one of the, the key things that's kind of coming out of uh, a lot of these statistics is there is a massive global skills shortage. So here's a graph from um, a, a, a website in the UK called IT Jobs Watch, and it tracks uh, uh, adverts for uh, jobs that it can find in the UK. And what we see here is a massive increase in just in the term cybersecurity being listed in job adverts. So what we're seeing now is that um, uh, the term cybersecurity is ranked 66 out of all of the terms that are being looked for in terms of cybersecurity. On average, the median salary in the UK is around about uh, 58K, around 60K. And again, that's gone up from about 30K uh, about 10 years ago. And this is before we even start thinking about specialisms like um, SOC operators or uh, security analysts or security managers. ISC2, which is a professional body, in, has said that actually for the first time, skill shortage have su uh, surpassed 4 million open positions globally. So there is a massive shortage of, of skills to fill that. In North America alone, there is over half a million open positions. Um, there's been a 100% increase in Europe from 142,000 open positions to 291,000 open positions. So, and it, the demands are expected to increase. So workforce uh, needs are expected to increase by 145% to cope with the demands of, of modern practices. So by any stretch of the imagination, it is cybersecurity is an interesting, innovative industry to work in. It's growing rapidly and uh, there is a demand for people with the right skills. So that's been a bit of a whistle stop tour. Hopefully that's been interesting and useful. Um, so thank you and uh, I'm, welcome. I'm glad to take questions. Okay, thank you very much, Daniel. Uh, that was very good. Um, a number of questions have already come through and I think I have about 15 
that uh-huh. you go through for me as we still wait for more. Okay. okay. Um, so, so the so first just, one. Yep. Mm-hmm. Okay. On. So the first one from Shatha is asking, does cybersecurity depend on the study of software engineering? And which of these measures is more important? So it depends on the type of course that you're going for and, and the type of uh, specific role that you want to go for. Um, for our master's degree, we don't specifically require anything in software engineering. We're very broad, as I've described, in terms of the modules that we cover. But we require a good uh, qualification in a computer science related degree. So software engineering would work. If you're going into a more specialist um, cybersecurity program, something that is perhaps uh, looking on, looking at um, maybe penetration testing, malware, reverse engineering, uh, or really detailed systems design, then you may need something like a cybersecurity, uh, so, sorry, a software engineering degree um, to, to, to really underpin uh, your knowledge before you go into it. It really does depend on the program and the jobs that you want to go go into. So what I suggest is, um, you know, research the university that you're going to apply to, um, and then also have a look at uh, the types of careers that you want to go go into, and maybe perhaps get uh, get in contact with um, professional bodies in your country and and see if they've got any information around the prerequisites for particular roles related to cybersecurity. Okay, thank you. Um, second one, how long is the duration um, of the course? What will be the first thing that I will learn um, um, during cybersecurity? And is an experience important for new students who want to study? Um, okay, so uh, as a general rule, in, within cybersecurity industry, you never stop learning. It's a constant process of learning because um, as I've said before, the attackers are always innovating and changing the way their, their, their approaches to targeting systems. So you will always be learning. With our program, it lasts for a year full time. Um, so it starts in October and finishes uh, just before October. Um, uh, the first thing you'll learn on our course is uh, information security management. So this is a very broad uh, module that covers everything really at a high level and tells you how everything fits together effectively. But it's how you uh, undertake management approaches uh, uh, with, for cybersecurity. Um, experience is important. Um, it's not necessarily a prerequisite for, cyber, for, for applicants onto uh, many of the programs. Uh, but what you find is like programs like, such as ours, is we try and provide um, uh, in, uh, experience as best we can. So we provide uh, industry projects as part of the dissertation. We also provide um, uh, industry experience uh, and other forms of placement, guest lectures um, uh, for, from people from industry. So again, it's something, to, it's something that's worth asking your potential universities that you're you're applying to is what what's the industry experience that uh, potentially you'll get as part of the course okay um questions are getting more so i'll put two in one so we mm-hmm. can address them quickly so this is two in one one how dangerous are the cyber tools and two is it safe to store data in cloud storage so yes, it's pretty safe to store data in cloud storage, but like anything, it, you, what you should do is think about what you're storing. Um, it's not a simple case that it's, it's uh, perfect to store like, everything that you ever do. You might want to p- protect some of your own personal information on a thumb drive uh, locally. Um, so just have a think about whether, you know, how important that, that is to you. And that's one of the key things that we do as part of the program is to get people to think about how to make cyber risk-based decisions on, on undertaking certain activities. The tools uh, potentially can be quite dangerous and it's more dangerous depending on where you are in the world. So one of the key things uh, that you need to be aware of is that in some uh, countries, some tools are perfectly legal and in other countries the same tool is completely illegal and you can go to jail for a very long time so you need to be aware of um uh the these the the rules of your own location and what you can and you can't do 
when in the UK, we provide a safe learning space for people to practice with the tools and understand the techniques that attackers will undertake. Uh, and so, so that becomes a legal safe location for, for cybersecurity experts to, um, to, to, to uh, cybersecurity students to practice their skills. Okay, thank you very much. Next two, are there specific laws regarding cybersecurity and yes, is yeah. cybersecurity more about software or hardware? So there are specific laws regarding cybersecurity, as I was mentioning before, and it's highly dependent on where you are in the world. Um, uh, so you really need to, to, to think about, um, uh, you know, what, what the laws are in your particular country or your particular geographical region um, and pay attention to those. Um, you know, I, I wouldn't advocate on doing you know, just owning certain tools can potentially or, uh, or undertaking certain activities or contacting certain people could be against the law in, in, in certain countries. So you do need to be very careful. Mm -hmm. um, it's, uh, cyber security used to be primarily focused on software and information, um, but recent uh, cyber security attacks against hardware have really thrown that out of the window. As we've seen again, the, the attacks against the Intel architectures, um, where people have been able to exfiltrate data off CPUs. Uh, it's, it's, it's a real mix now. And certainly the hardware issues, uh, security issues are not going away. And it's an increasingly interesting area to research. Okay, thank you so much. Um, next one. Um, can we study cybersecurity as a main course or as a program? Is it a full program or is it just a course? And then um, the next one is, um, what's the safest way for someone um, who doesn't have knowledge about cybersecurity to keep their content safe? So um, at Lancaster, uh, we only offer the MSc in cybersecurity, although we have some undergraduate modules in our computer science degree. I know in other universities in the UK and elsewhere globally, they offer majors at an undergraduate level. But at, the, at Lancaster University, we only offer the MSc in cybersecurity, which is the specialization. The best thing you can do in terms of um, protecting yourself is uh, make sure you change all your passwords to something strong, make sure your PC and your software is up to date in terms of software patches. Um, uh, make sure that you remove any applications that you're not using, particularly on your smartphone. So all those fun games that you've been downloading and got bored of, make sure you delete those. Um, and then very, very periodically have a purge of any information that you're holding on your um, on your PCs in terms of, do you really need to keep that file? Can you delete it? Or should you back it up into something like a pen drive or some offline storage? Probably would be my top tips. Okay, thank you very much. Um, how much does the course cost? Um, the, uh, the MSc at, at Lancaster is um, 10,500 pounds or thereabouts, I think. Um, uh, and we're one of the cheaper ones in the UK. Um, the, they all roughly range from, from about £10,000 for master's degrees, £10,000 up to um, uh, uh, around £1,500 for, uh, sorry, uh, £15,000 for UK EU students. I'm yeah. not quite sure what the overseas student rate is. Yeah, for overseas, um, roughly, usually between sixteen to 21000 yeah. Yeah, so so that's that's typically typically what it is, um, okay. but yeah, again, it's uh, uh, that we we only really offer the master's degree. There are other online courses, so there are plenty of courses on free online learning environments that you can take that might be useful. Um, so it's certainly worth checking out uh, some of those. Okay, thank you. Next batch. Um, is cybersecurity harmful for health? For example, uh, like stressing you out or causing panic. And then the second one is a bit related also. So, so like, is there a relationship between health and safety and then cybersecurity? So I, I've never seen any studies that specifically relate cybersecurity to uh, health damage. Um, but obviously any stressful situation will cause uh, issues for individuals. So, you know, in a workplace, if you're undergoing a cybersecurity attack and it's a long-term cybersecurity attack, for example, then perhaps, you know, the, the, the stress implications of that might be harmful, but I've not seen anything um, specific. Um, 
uh, the se second question, yes, uh, health and safety and cybersecurity are often linked. I mean, I talk about um, health and safety within the cybersecurity risk assessment module um, uh, and thinking again about how cybersecurity is a, a mechanism to help support businesses rather than a, a sort of mechanism to hinder them. Health and safety is there to keep your staff healthy and safe while they're working for you and make, helping them to be productive rather than it just being a set of rules that gets in the way. And, and that's what I believe that cybersecurity is there for too. Okay, thank you. Um, next batch. What, uh, which security apps do you suggest to protect personal data? There are many apps, but I don't know which one is the best. And the second, can I be a cyber crime detective by studying cybersecurity? So the, in answer to the first question, um, my recommendation these days is just to use the applications that come bundled primarily with Windows. So Windows Defender, making sure that you're turning on disk encryption that comes with uh, Windows. By and large, there really isn't that much need to, to install third-party antivirus products these days. But you know, if, if you do, then you know, just get one. They're all about the same. Um, but Windows Defender does a really good job. Um, if you're... Uh, I would also recommend that any thumb drives that you have, you put some le level of encryption on. And again, that can be provided to you by um, uh, Windows operating system uh, free of charge. So really there's no need to, to install third party applications. And I would be very wary. I would never install a third party security application, which is free. The likelihood is that it's probably going to do something bad to your system. Um, and at the end of the day, you pay for what you get. So, um, if you're pay not paying for something, then you can expect a lot of bad things to happen, is my general rule. Um, in terms of becoming a cyber detective, you need to have a good uh, understanding of cybersecurity and technology uh, and so on, which courses like our MSC will help you with. But typically in most places, um, if you want to enter law enforcement, you will have to go through that law enforcement's training program. So I would uh, highly recommend that, uh, you know, you investigate what it requ what's required of you to be um, a, a police officer in, uh, in your local area, um, in your country, um, and then explore whether they have any specific programs for people interested in, in cybersecurity and, and, and go that way. Okay. Um, next one, what's the difference between cybersecurity and hacking? And there's a second one, whether cybersecurity interrupts with telecom engineering. So uh, the way that I, I mean, so the way that I kind of see cybersecurity and hacking, cybersecurity is around defense. So how do I defend and protect the people, the processes, and the organizations that, that you'll go and work for? Hacking is really the general term given to trying to break into a system. So on our program, we do teach hacking techniques because the way that we see it is we believe that it's important for uh, defenders to understand how the, the bad guys operate. Um, and so if we can teach you how they do it, how they think and how they behave, then it makes it easier for you to defend. Uh, so that's one of the, the key things that... Um, uh, sort of the key differentiations that uh, uh, make there. Um, in terms of cybersecurity in the telecommunications industry, obviously the, all the technologies we're talking about work over the top of uh, telecoms networks. Um, but what we find is that most uh, countries have very tight laws over what you can and you can't do with telecommunications networks. So the attackers aren't really going after those, uh, certainly not uh, cyber criminals. Maybe nation states might be going after those. Um, and we've seen a number of uh, debates globally about um, uh, nation states getting involved in national infrastructures uh, like telecommunications networks and the rights and the wrongs of that. Cybersecurity, a lot of the focus is on the end systems, and that's where really where the information and the value is, and that's where a lot of the cyber criminals are going. And so that's where a lot of the work is. Effectively, the criminals go where they can make money, and they can make money off targeting your end systems, your computers, putting ransomware on there, and stopping you from getting access to things. Okay, thank you. Um, next two, as we move on, um, there's a general question on whether people need to learn programming they want to study cybersecurity. And there's also another question on top organizations that 
um, employ students who study cybersecurity? So in terms of programming languages, um, you know, we, we take a pragmatic approach. We, we use Python quite a lot because a lot of the type of work that we do is about quickly combining things together to run scripts or process data or to combine uh, different applications and functions together. So Pro Python is really easy to, to use that and, and quickly um, uh, uh, come up with uh, things that, that, that we can uh, use to respond to maybe attacks. So Python is one of the, the things that I would consider really learning. But in terms of some of the hardcore cybersecurity stuff, certainly C and assembler is really, really important. Um, in terms of top organizations, you've got your big uh, global organizations like your IBMs and your Cisco's. Um, they're, they're, they are employing a lot of cybersecurity professionals, but there are a lot of other organizations that sit outside of that. You know, are one of the biggest consumers of cybersecurity technology and, um, and people uh, is the financial institutions. So, you know, banks are really recruiting a, 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 a massive cybersecurity workforce just because they are pretty much completely 100% online and, um, and they need to protect the money at the end of the day. And, uh, uh, and so what we're, <coughs> excuse me. So what we're seeing is, uh, you know, a real uptake in financial organizations, large financial organizations hiring cybersecurity professionals. Okay, thank you very much. Next two, what's the difference between authenticity and authorization? And do you suggest any website that can help with knowledge on cybersecurity? Yeah, so authentication and authorization, they're two different aspects, as I was kind of alluding to before. So authentication is about proving who I am. So, um, I, you know, saying that I am Dan Prince and I, I'm providing some information about that. I mean, uh, you know, Paul and Katie have, uh, uh, you know, believe that I'm Dan Prince because I've got mm -hmm. the right email, but, you know, giving my email address um, when I walk into a bank is not enough. I have to give uh, some other form of photographic ID. Mm -hmm. um, my phone, for example, you know, requires me to have a pin number, you know, a fingerprint or something. So it's something that, that proves who I am. Typically, it's something I know or something I have. So a token, a fingerprint or, or a password. Um, authorization then tells the system what I can do. So, um, and we're, we're familiar with uh, the, those issues on, on Windows when you're perhaps not an administrator or on a Linux platform when you're not root, you need to elevate your privileges so that you can actually do more things on the system. And that's a process of authorization. So authorization tells the system and tells others what the individual can do and what actions they can take and what privileges they have. So that's the difference between the, uh, the two. I forgot what the second question was. Um... Okay, I think I've just let me go to the ones that we've let me get you. The oh, next the site. One. Sorry, what was the site? Yeah, so the um, what I would suggest you do a really yes, good website. website. Sorry, yeah, yeah. What I would so, do is I would um, I would really have a look at a website called Krebs on Security, a really good investigative journalist who looks at cybersecurity issues and he does really good write ups around the history, the technology, what's working. And it, it, he's been doing it for decades and it's really, really interesting. So, and it's really accessible. So I would, I, I would, pref I think that's a good starting point, start and read those Krebs on security articles and just keep up to date with what's going on in the industry is a really, uh, really important aspect. So that's where I would go to. Oh, okay. Thank you. Um, next one is, is cybersecurity part of computer science or do you think it's better to study computer science first and then move to cybersecurity? The second one is, um, do you have a data science course? Yeah, so I mean, cybersecurity is part of computer science. It's intrinsically linked. There's no point thinking about building a system and then making it secure. You need to think about how you design and implement it securely from the outset. So, so it's in, intrinsically linked. So I suggest, uh, you know, you really have to think about how cybersecurity um, or how any undergraduate program links um, cybersecurity in with the computer science program. 
uh, you know, asking questions such as if you're looking at just a software engineering program, are they teaching secure programming practices, those types of things from the outset. We have a specialized cybersecurity master's degree because our program is really trying to help individuals span, like we said, span the gap between the technology and then also the um, uh, and the rest of the business. So that's a specific skill set that we're trying to foster um, in, in people. At Lancaster, we do have a data science master's degree. We don't currently have any modules on data science in our cybersecurity program, but that's something that we are hoping to develop in the future. There is a close relationship between data science and cybersecurity as we're finding that actually we need data science and uh, artificial intelligence machine learning approaches to help enhance the way that individual cybersecurity specialists are working because we can't just, we can't do it all manually. We need to be augmented by data science technologies to be able to process all the data and information that we're getting from uh, the cybersecurity instruments we have in the network to detect when bad people are trying to attack our systems. Okay, thank you. Next one, um, is it crucial to receive additional certificates like those offered by global organizations after graduating from, say, the master's? Okay, so one of the, so, so what you'll find is that when you go, after graduating from the master's, when you go into uh, the, a specific role, typically that's where you start to move into professional certifications. So um, typically the, the, the roles would then ask you to take on things like, um, you know, taking a, a specific penetration testing course or understanding a particular technology like the Cisco uh, accreditations or Microsoft accreditations. So again, it kind of comes back to the point in cybersecurity, you never stop learning and you always have to keep maintaining your information. And one of the best ways that you can do that is by going on courses and getting recognition from those courses. So I, I, you, you find in a lot of organizations, they do require you to go on and maintain your professional um, knowledge base. And that will be through courses, attending events and getting certificates for it. So yeah, I would expect you to, to continue to have to take certifications depending on the type of jobs and depend, it will depend on the level that, of certifications that you'll need to get. Okay, thank you. Um, we still have about 10 minutes plus to go. So um, next two, how can I protect our personal information when using social media? And second one, is cyber security and information security the same? Okay, so the first one, um, well, the first thing is, uh, don't give away your personal information on social media platforms. I mean, it sounds a bit flippant and trite, but actually it's really important. So uh, making sure that you've got your privacy settings set correctly, not even supplying that information or even supplying false information. Um, so, you know, on Facebook, you can pretty much put your location to be anywhere. You don't have to actually put your own location. So th think about, whether you really need to give that information, if you have to give it, whether it has to be accurate, and then making sure that the settings are set to the level that you want. Do you want everybody to see your posts? Um, so it's really important for you to start to think about uh, how you change the settings on social media away from the default to protect your personal information. But then also starting to think, do you really need to be posting that? Do you really need to be giving that information away? Do you really need to be telling people that you're on holiday and that your house is uh, unoccupied and potentially uh, available to burglars? So these are the types of things you need to, to really, really question. Um, and I think, uh, personally, I think the world would be a better place if people didn't share so much on social media. Um, so just thinking about how you actually um, uh, control your own information is really important. And a lot of the social media platforms are getting much better at enabling you to do that. But you do have to dig and you do have to change those settings. In terms of whether cybersecurity and information security, uh, whether they're the same, yeah. sometimes within documentation and news stories, we see them used interchangeably. My view is that cybersecurity is a broader security question than information security. Information security is about protecting the information that is held on systems. Cybersecurity is about protecting the people, the process, the technology, and the organization ultimately from some sort of digital or digitally related attack. So it's a bigger question. So um, 
I often uh, articulate the information security is, is a subset, especially when you start to throw in things like, well, what if I have a smart building where I work and all the, the whole building's automated and, and you know, the way that people get in is through swipe cards or biometric access. These are all digital systems. And now it's not just about information, it's about protecting access to the building. I'm sure we've all seen like Mission Impossible uh, films where people have like tried to hack into, into buildings to allow the good guys to go in and steal whatever they need to steal. Um, and it's those are the types of things that we need to start thinking about more broadly. It's not about the protection of information now, it's about the protection of the building. So that's, that's how I see the relationship. Uh, uh, some people disagree with me and some people have a completely alternative view. Um, but broadly, I, I see what we need to do is protect our digital world and uh, cybersecurity for me is the answer to that. Oh, okay, thank you. Next to you. Um, is there any course I can take online to start on this field? I just finished my bachelor's degree in information studies. That's um, one. And then a um, second one says that if I receive a login um, in my personal account from another person, how do I deal with that quickly? Okay, so the first one, again, I, I would uh, just have a look at um, the free online courses from uh, like places like FutureLearn or uh, like any of these flip classroom kind of uh, platforms. They're, they're typically of a reasonably good quality and they certainly get you started. Um, but again, you know, you can get a lot of information these days from trusted sources like Krebs on security. And then from there, you can spider out. I mean, the key thing that I think uh, I would argue anybody needs to foster as a part of a cybersecurity, as to become a cybersecurity specialist in any of the disciplines, is, is a strong level of curiosity um, and research skills. So I would really su just suggest you start somewhere like Krebs on Security or one or two places and then use that as a springboard to investigate more broadly where you might be able to go and, and the, the different information sources. But certainly places like FutureLearn as an online uh, provider, um, provide online courses and some of those are free, like the starter um, uh, like a starter cybersecurity course on there. Um, but there are a number of others as well that, that, that are worth investigating. Um, if I receive a login to my personal account in any application by another person, how do I deal with it quickly? I'm not quite sure I understand the question. Um, uh, but one of the things I, I would uh, really advocate generally for everybody is to make sure they have two-factor authentication turned on to their, on their accounts um, so that they do get notified if, uh, if the system gets locked, if they, an account gets logged in somewhere else uh, or um, at the very least, or that you have to have your smartphone with you, for example, to get a receiver, a, a unique number that then also logs uh, that you need to log into a new location. The other thing you can do is regularly check where you're logged into certain web-based applications like your Gmail or your Outlook accounts or your Facebook accounts and just start to um, unauthorized computers from, from accessing those um, to make sure that uh, you know, you're only logging into certain places. It's part of good cyber hygiene for an individual, really. All right, thank you. Um, if I want to work on a, an ethical hacker, should I study cybersecurity? And second one, what about cybersecurity in satellite communication? So, yeah, I mean, cybersecurity is quite a broad uh, um, element. Uh, so it'll give you a really broad background. So that's one way of doing it before going into specialized uh, ethical hacking degrees uh, or um, certifications. But I think for uh, if you just if you know you want to be an ethical hacker, then one of the things that I would recommend that you do is take some of the um, you know, the paid for ethical hacking courses and get the certification there. So uh, from places like OSCP or EC Council, um, I mean, look for information about the types of jobs. So what, what I would recommend that you do is, you know, if you're interested in pen testing, ethical hacking, look for job adverts at the companies in your region that are, are, are hiring and see what qualifications they're requiring. In actual fact, a lot of companies, if you just ring them up and say, I'm interested in this, you know, what can you advise? They'll probably put you in contact with somebody that will tell you to go away and do this particular course or take this particular certificate. Um, so, you know, 
it really depends on how motivated you are or whether you, you want something a bit more of a broader experience. Um, but if you're deaf, dead set that you want to be an ethical hacker, look at what, how the companies are hiring those particular individuals, find out what qualifications they're after and just pursue those qualifications. Um, in terms of cybersecurity in satellite communications, yes, it's a big issue like any platform. Um, uh, and that we've seen an, an, an increase in the number of attacks against these types of platforms because satellite communications is becoming cheaper. And we see things like Elon Musk putting up uh, the Starlink platform. Um, and so as satellite communications becomes more prevalent and more, um, uh, yeah, so it becomes more prevalent, more commonplace, um, you're, you're going to start to see an increase in attacks, especially if criminals can see a way of making money out of it. Okay. Um, next, I think. What specialization is included in cybersecurity? Is CE the right choice? And then there's a one asking about difference between networking and cybersecurity. Um, so I'm not quite I'm not quite sure what the first question is okay. referring to. Um, but uh, you know, cybersecurity, you know, is a broad term, and there are a number of specific roles that come off the back of that. So. There are things like um, data analysts for looking at uh, cybersecurity information and working out what's going on, uh, reverse malware engineers, uh, security architects, security managers, SOC analysts, SIEM analysts. There, there is a very, you know, the, the number of roles in cyber, related to cybersecurity and protection of infrastructures has grown quite significantly over the last, uh, last couple of years, particularly in the last five years. So, um, Again, uh, there's lots of opportunities to specialize. Typically, what a lot of organizations will do is they, particularly starting in junior positions, is they'll move you around uh, to different sections within the cybersecurity uh, or part of the organization. So you get a broader experience and then they will let you specialize in, into a particular area that you want to go into. If uh, uh, the alternative is you already know and you've got experience and then you'll go into a very specific role that they're hiring for. Um, the difference between cybersecurity and networking, well, really networking is, is more about the fundamental ways in which systems communicate with each other. Um, you know, what, what are the, how do we design and build networks? And sure, there is a security element that needs to go into that because you need to design protected networks. Um, but cybersecurity is so much more than just the network. It's looking more broadly, as I've said, around the, in, uh, the interactions with the business, the interaction with the business processes, the individuals, and how that presents a, a risk to the business or, other, or, or, or organization that everybody's working for. So, so network and network security is probably a specific sub-discipline of cybersecurity is one way that you could position it. Okay, um, we have a few, but I'll kindly suggest if any of us have any new questions, if you can email them to admissions at iecabroad.com, then we can help you answer that. So then we can finish off with those that we have today and end the session, then we can be able to get back to you later, please. Thank you very much. Uh, there's a question, whether there's a difference between blockchain and cybersecurity. And um, there's another one I think is also important. Is that do you think that cybersecurity is enough now that hackers are able to hack both hardware, software, as well as server? So is there something more to learn? Well, there's always something more to learn. As I said, you, 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 the world is constantly changing. It's one of the most innovative disciplines in computer science. So you know, I, I think it's, it's so important that, uh, you know, we stay, try and stay at the cutting edge the best we can. We try and do that through our research at the university. Um, like I say, I do a lot of network research, um, network security research. Colleagues, you do a lot of cloud-based security research. I have a colleague that's do it, look, focusing on uh, critical infrastructure, industrial control systems, security research. Uh, so, so, yeah, I mean, it we can only do so much and it's never going to be enough, but if we get enough good people together to um, defend, then hopefully we can, uh, we can succeed and protect the, the things that are most important to us in terms of whether blockchain and cybersecurity, what the difference is, 
yeah, I mean, blockchain is a particular technology that's used uh, primarily to support financial transactions, but it can be used for storing any information that needs to be publicly available, but secure. Um, the interesting thing about blockchain is it's not really as private as people think, and it's not confidential in any way, shape or form. So uh, because it's a public ledger, the, the key word there is public. Anything that's put on the blockchain can be seen by anybody. Um, cybersecurity is the broad discipline of protecting infrastructure. So really blockchain, the difference is blockchain is a specific security cryptographic technology. Cybersecurity is the discipline of protecting things that involve digital systems. Okay, thank you. Um, if you want, what's, um, who is responsible for the SS cross the world and who makes it? I don't know if you know about that. Maybe it's a term in your area. And then does coding help with cybersecurity? Is there, uh, uh, and there is a website called Code Academy. Is it a good website? Uh, I don't know what uh, the SS cross the word uh, I don't know what that is. Um, okay. uh, so I couldn't comment. Um, coding does help with cybersecurity and is, is important uh, for um, cybersecurity, particularly long term. Um, I, I, I'm not uh, too sure of any particular coding websites to, to refer people to. I mean, we have stuff that we obviously we teach at Lancaster. Uh, but again, if people are asking for Python courses typically. I, I often refer them to, um, again, courses from FutureLearn, but I have heard of Code Academy before, but I've never used it, so I, I couldn't recommend it. Oh, okay, thank you very much. I think we are almost wrapping up. Um, how do I basically trust a website, app, or program? Where are some, or what, where are some, do I need to give my email? And is 5G technology safe? Yeah, 5G, I mean, there's been so much nonsense about 5G technology, it's unreal. You know, 5G is a safe technology. It's no worse for you than 4G technology. Uh, all these rumors about COVID being caused by 5G and all this type of nonsense is just ridiculous. Um, 5G technology is a safe technology. Uh, health, you know, in terms of your health. Um, it's also a, a, a secure technology. It has a number of security enhancements over and above 4G. Um, the, the, the challenge with, between 5G and 4G is that 5G is a different network architecture to 4G. 5G pushes a lot of the intelligence out to the edge of the network, whereas 4G tends to concentrate it in the middle. Uh, and that, that's going to cause a, a number of different types of cybersecurity challenges, which we need, to, we, we need to understand what they will be, but we won't be able to understand what they are until that gets put into play. So um, like anything, we don't know what the problems are gonna be until we really start using it. Um, how do you trust a website? Well, make sure you check that it's signed. So make sure you check for the HTTPS logo and you can check the, um, uh, check the certificate is actually valid. That's a key and important part. Um, but uh, really, a lot of it goes down to your gut instinct. And if, if you feel like the website is pressuring you to do stuff or trying to trick you, then just walk away. You know, it's not 100% not necessary that you need to put that information in. Um, if you are really worried about it, browse that website in private mode, uh, making sure you clean out any cookies. And also, you know, have a number of dummy email accounts, and this is what I do, um, that tie back to me. So that it's not for a nefarious purpose, but I use it. I use them for websites that I'm not 100% uh, certain about. Um, so if that email gets burnt because, you know, it goes onto some spam list, I'm not, I haven't um, lost my main way of communicating with people. Okay. Um, I think we have the last two here and then we'll be done. So how do I protect our privacy against ISP companies? And then the second one is how do you protect sensitive information handled and stored by third party vendors? 
Well, the answer to both of those questions is to come on the um, master's degree at Lancaster University and we'll tell you all how to do it. But, um, uh, you know, the, one of the, the, I mean, if you have some real concerns about your ISP, then perhaps you need to change your ISP. If you can't change your ISP, potentially look at uh, using virtual private networking technology. Virtual private networking technology, though, in some countries is restricted and potentially against the law. So you need to be 100% uh, certain that you are able to use that particular technology. Um, well, sorry, what was the second question? It was the same. How do you protect um, for, against third parties? Sensitive oh, okay. information? So, so again, you know, if you're um, using a cloud-based provider you know, and you're not 100% certain, can you move to another one? Um, the other thing is, you, know, you don't have to put your information in that cloud provider. Your storage is relatively cheap. Pen drives, thumb drives are relatively cheap for quite a lot of storage nowadays. So you can uh, put it on an encrypted disk. You don't have to put it into the cloud. So have a think about what information and, uh, you're storing and where and why. Um, but if you do have to put it into the cloud, you know, to get, don't have to have a complex photo sharing system. Just get a basic cloud-based storage and uh, encrypt everything that you put into the cloud. That's, uh, that's a really simple, sort of simple approach. Okay, Daniel, thank you very much. I think that's it from the Q&A at this session. Thanks a lot for all the information you've presented. Uh, I'll bring Katie in at this time as we wrap up on this session. Fabulous, thank you so much, Paul, and thank you, Daniel. Um, yeah, that presentation was fabulous. Thank you so much for taking the time and taking the time to answer so many questions as well. Um, a few people in the chat box have been saying that it's been really useful as well. Mara has just said, thanks a lot. This meeting and the questions were very useful. So um, yeah, thank you again for taking the time. Um, just a reminder to everybody that we will send out your certificates for attendance by email. So keep an eye out for those. If you do have any other questions, as Paul said before, please just send an email across to admissions at IEC abroad. Um, but yeah, other than that, take care everybody. Thank you for attending. And once again, thank you so much, Dan, um, for providing this seminar. No problem, my pleasure. All right. All right. Thank you. Thanks so much, everybody. Bye-bye. Bye-bye, right. everyone.